introduce ourselves and then we can have an open dialogue and we're getting everything. Okay, that Mark Christmas. Start with, with Mr. Point. with the professor. My name is Dr. Speak Mark louder. <laughs> and what are you here for? John, why John. why are you here? I'm here to actually do a Socratic dialogue on the topic of artificial intelligence, fact or fantasy. What is a, a, a Socratic dialogue? A Socratic dialogue is a dialogue of directed questions and answers that lead to more questions and answers and ultimately learning. Okay, so we're talking about a learning process. Correct. Can we call it a lifelong learning process? Correct. Thank you very much. We were hearing from you. And you here? And you? I'm Pam Falchetto. I'm a big advocate of hearing and listening to everybody's point of view. Because from the question and answers, you find out we're all different and all fabulously interesting. Uh, I go by the name of Ian Yeager, and I'm a generalist thinker. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm John Crocker. I'm here as a uh, advocate for lifelong learning. I believe le learning is a process that should continue. I think we learn by asking questions and having an open dialogue. Uh, we're here at Sisters Uptown Bookshop, who has uh, been gracious enough to invite us here. So this is a presentation of lifelong learning. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, um, Jennifer, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Will you come in and just introduce yourself as, as part of the cycle or the circle? I've been given my orders. Yes, I'm coming. Okay, yeah. watching orders. <laughs> Hi, everyone. No, we want you to speak louder because we I'm want Jennifer Wilson. I am the keeper of this space, Sisters Uptown Bookstore and Cultural Center. We've existed in the community for the last 14 years. Uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful vineyard. It's been an exciting one because we have found that we are a beacon of light uh, in this community and we're proud to be. Uh, we mostly, like I was telling my new friend, um, mostly we're successful because of our events. Uh, events bring people in and we get to network and uh, introduce the projects that we're doing. We've met some wonderful people over the years, and so we're excited about uh, being in the community and hosting uh, such events as the one that we're having today. Uh, the professor is wonderful and is the most brilliant um, human being that I've met in a long, long time. He came and did some work in terms of a presentation with um, his computer and his book and whatever, and I just was like, all right, I know, fabulous. I can get this one day. <laughs> so it's wonderful <laughs> to <That's> have <laughs> such brilliance in our presence and to have him embrace this cultural center uh, in terms of the work that he's doing. So we're uh, proud and honored to have uh, the professor uh, here today. And we welcome all of you who've come for the first time. And those of you who've been in the past, we're welcoming you back again. And it's just been wonderful. It's good to see Juan. He Thanks did an art exhibit here uh, some years ago. Uh, G. Arnold is a wonderful uh, author who's been with us a number of times with her second book now. She's doing a book signing here August 30th. And I met my old friend here who said he was here about three years ago. So it's just a continuous cycle and circle of us just doing work together and networking. And so I'm real proud uh, to be the keeper of this space. Mr. Crocker has been a wonderful instrument in the community. Uh, he puts us together uh, when he can for this type venue. So we're elated and happy to see him out wheeling about and doing what he does uh, in spite of. And so we're grateful to the Most High that he's here uh, in the present and that um, the, he's moving through divine energy and whatever
whatever this is is trying to take his body and his spirit is not going to do it because he's he fights he's a fighter so we're grateful uh, that the brother is in the midst today and all of you we are just welcoming you here to do whatever work it is you do uh, you know that you have a place to do it so we're grateful um, we're honored and so professor uh, we're happy that you chose this place to do your work. And so thank you. Beautifully. Beautifully said. That's what I'm talking about. Beautifully said. In terms of who are we, what are we about. Now, Dr. Doctor, let me, as a uh, seeker after the artificial intelligence path of wisdom, um, say that there is a prevailing sense um, throughout the in industry of computing and also many others that the idea was um, malconceived in the first place possibly because of the influence of the uh, book of What Computers Can't Do by Dreyfus and um, uh, very largely, um, I think it was a, a pulling of the plug of, of funding and, and in, um, enthusiasm for it that happened in the late 80s and early 90s. And um, what is a what what is a seeker to do? Okay, I want to take over as the moderator and bring out the best in all of you. I'd like to introduce, as we said before, Dr. Thank you. Now, you got the floor. We're gonna ask you questions. We're gonna dialogue. The one thing that you said some time ago, a few minutes ago, and also mentioned to me in, in a, a Socratic dialogue. What exactly is the Socratic dialogue? The Socratic dialogue. Please speak a little louder. Okay. A Socratic dialogue is a directed series of questions and answers that lead to further questions and answers and ultimately learning. So we're talking about lifelong learning. Correct. Now, your book is entitled what? Nervotron, a functional silicon analog to the neuron. Would you say that louder? And would you then explain what is it? Okay. Nervotron, a functional silicon analog to the neuron. A nervotron is a synthetic hardware version of a neuron, which is a biological information processing element typically of nervous systems and brains. Is that in the human being? It could be a human being, it no. could also be in a lower life form. Yeah, but now, when you say the, 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 the terminology, are you comparing the science and technology of a, um, no, no, what is that thing called, neuron? What nervotron. Is Nerva, what is a nervotron? Nerv a nervotron is an artificial hardware analog to the neuron. Okay. Nervotron is actually a concatenation of two Latin words meaning nervo electronico, which means electronic nerve. Electronic nerve. Now, electronic nerve, as it applies to a high technology or later technology, how does it apply in terms of the human body? Break okay. it down, brother. That is part of, in terms of the human body, the biological communication system between the extremities and the central nervous system, primarily the human brain. So can, I, can I ask a, a question? Good. Um, I think when you're talking about a computer or something technological, you're talking about something predictable. You know, Apple works in a certain way. This, do all our neurons work in a certain way? So when information processes through us, 
like right here in this room, it went through in very different manners for all of us. It got filtered in a very different manner. So what do you feel about that? Okay. Biological neural networks yeah. function differently than von Neumann machines, which are basically the design of modern day computers. Right. Now, the foible of the hard AI school is that they believe the von Neumann machine and the human brain are both finite state automata. A finite state automata is an information processing machine that has a finite number of processing states of inputs to outputs. However, the human brain is a multi-dimensional circuit type information processing system that processes information and a multitude of sensory inputs. A von Neumann machine typically does not have the feedback loops. However, there are control systems which are computerized and there are robots which are computerized and they do have feedback loops albeit they quite primitive. How, how does that compare with today's learning process or the, uh, uh, compare and um, compare and, and what is the other word? Contrast. What is the difference? Huh? Contrast. Contract between the two systems that you just described, the human and the technological. Oh, okay. the, the contrast is that a neuron has multiple logic states, whereas a von Neumann machine has only two logic states. Would that be the um, um, on and off Zero, one, uh, how it feeds in? Binary. 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 It, it, would that be a binary code? It would for, yes. for the von Neumann machine, but what, but the, 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 uh, neurotron. the neurotron would in fact have uh, multiple states corresponding to like a modal logic or perhaps a fuzzy logic kind of so in a sense it's panoply a of, of possible values of either absolute certainty to absolute absolute certainty otherwise and, and a, a radiation shading so basically it's a synthetic neuron, on the right, right track? What do you think? Very, very close. The Nervotron has multiple states of pathways interconnections between each of the Nervotron processing units. And that's analogous to biological neural networks which have multiple interconnection states. For example, in the human brain, each neuron is capable of connecting to 80,000 other neurons. And there are over 5 million neurons just in the neocortical region of the brain. So now my understanding of a neuron was that it had many inputs and one output. It has many inputs. The input. human brain yeah. neurons. And of course, we could make other it has many inputs, but since it's living tissue, it can actually connect to multiple outputs. Can I ask you a question now? Whether let, let's get it down to instead of sheer numbers, do you still feel that each of our neurons, no matter how many we are as human beings, vary in how we experience them? That is based upon how the brain is wired. Right. Each person Tell has how that comes into e each person has what they call a different set of instantiated engrams. Right. 
each engram is the wiring pattern of the brain. And the instantiation means that the experiences and information has been formed into certain patterns of circuits that were constantly being expressed electrochemically. Right, so you, for instance, you know, one group of people might go someplace new and take in something that's really wonderful culturally and love it and express it, and another group of people might go and take it in another way. People have different experiences with the exact same process. Yes. Okay. Does and that change with that, anything? That would, be for sure. that would be changing according to the experience that they are experiencing at that moment coupled with the experience that they experienced in the past. The past experience would act more as a filter slash information channeling type process. The nerve what you mean. Okay. Love it. The Nervotron was designed to be a hardware analog of a biological neuron. Now, in terms of biological intelligence, there is a, a scale of biological intelligence that goes from a nanochemical intelligence of viruses and bacteria to a simplistic neural intelligence of the hydra, which is called the nerve net, to the next stage of complexity of neurons formation for insects. The, the hydra's nerve net is actually, it's, it's touch system. Right? Correct. Like, but what, 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 and I as, as with an amoeba as well. And then, yeah, the next scale is actually in the invertebrates. That's the next scale. And then from there you move on to insects. I didn't hear that. And moving on up to um, I didn't, I, 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 I'm not hearing. Uh, uh, go ahead, Marco. The, 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 no, I mean, the, from I mean, the, from the, the um, uh, Hydra's touch network to the amoeba, which I don't actually remember having a nerve system at all, but um, it, it and, and then and then, but well. ultimately evolving into the, the amoeba has a pre-nerve system, mm -hmm. which is dependent upon ionic interaction with proteins in its membrane. What is ionic interaction? Ionic interaction is a way to transmit information from the environment to the processing center of the organism. Because of the, the brain um, is a neuro electrochemical information processing Explain system. neuroelectrical chemical. Not, in other words, an, uh, electrochemical, in other words, it's not just energy charges of electricity and it's not just chemical interactions, it's a combination it's of both. A a, 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 an impulse comes into the nerve and then it is changed into a chemical thing which happens and there are neurotransmitters and then it's changed back into electrical things and passed on to the next neuron. I think I, I, do I have a let off. Maybe it's just understanding it. Yes. Sometimes science is a very cold hard fact. You know, and it doesn't necessarily, so it's not about not getting the, the cancer, let's say, because that might be a DNA predisposition, scientific all across the board. And hopefully we study it and we get it and we understand it more. So do we take that and then search for how you don't get it? Or are we just learning the science of this? That's what I would like to know. Well, I feel it's a science. Is what a it science. Is. I'm it, sensing it that is we, have, we have a desire for, for um, um, 
the uh, for the course of discussion to become applied in social terms that are right. real, and but also there's a desire for the research to be presented. I think we should put the question right back to um, Dr. Batako and say, yeah. do, 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 what were you going to say? Okay. <laughs> the the sociological aspects exist, but they're more determined by the powers that be as opposed to whether people are capable of understanding or not understanding. Let me give you an example. Yeah, give me some example. Most people in the public school system take mathematics, take science, and in these institutions of public education, many a times they have someone trained in social studies teaching mathematics, which they have a phobia of mathematics, and they pass on this phobia to the students who develop a phobia and dislike of mathematics. Another thing is you have this similar process with the sciences where the, the instructor has a, a phobia because they don't understand it totally and it gets passed along to the students. Then you have on top of that that the education system that we work with in the, as a public education system was designed at a time where we had mass production industrial processes as a result of an industrial revolution. Well, we no longer need people to work on an assembly line tightening bolts. That's now done by robots. Instead, we need people to be able to think on their feet, to reason in a way where they can extrapolate to new levels to create and also to be able to teach themselves. See, education should be to teach you to teach yourself, not to spoon feed you on memorizing multiplication tables. You could easily buy a 495 credit card calculator to do ma uh, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. What you should do instead is be taught the definitions of multiplication, addition, subtraction, and division. Absolutely. Which is all and evolution and evolution as later on. Right. Correct. Which, which is bottom line in your public school. Correct. Where everybody doesn't get. Right. Well, I think, you know, if you're, if for some reason, you happen on this thing that you can think for yourself. Whether you're in a public school, whether you're there in a university, whether you're not, you, you start to trust your own instincts, your own way of getting information that you need at the time. You start heading out and expanding your life to fit whatever it is that you're interested in. And you don't look to other people for the answers, but you start to venture through yourself, and you go, lo and behold, look at this. I'm starting to add to the word I used before, my patina, okay, <laughs> that I'm adding to myself because I'm not learning from other things because mm -hmm. even as brilliant as somebody is, what they are filled up with is their knowledge. It's for your choice to pick and choose and add and, and subtract and in that question, I go back to the science of it again. It's which lottery ticket do you buy? Is yeah. Is it predisposed to be that way? To be a leader in thinking or uh, someone who is that way like you, Marco? You certainly didn't have the background to have this happen. You didn't. You were born Marco Batetta. There's no doubt about it. You just fed him all the time. And you did it, and you did it having a disability at seven years old that that the average person doesn't have. So you went through high school 
with a disability wind up the top 10 in your better high school, Bronx school or high school science or yeah. uh, whatever school it was, what was it that made you to be able to be the top 10 in one of the better high schools while you were dealing with your disability? Challenge, not disability. He isn't disabled. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> what was anyway. it? What was it? <laughs> well, first of all, my parents um, instilled in me a very uh, intense work ethic where they said you get out of life what you put into it. You work hard enough, you get what you work for. Uh, additionally, I went to a Jesuit high school which the standards in a Jesuit high school are significantly higher than that in a public school. Ooh. Did you hear it? That's actually true. Did I'm you hear it? Because did we you? don't pay our teachers. We yeah. have to did pay you our hear teachers. it? Did you hear it? Did you hear it? Sorry the for standards. Being now, mm -hmm. the standards are different because of they deal with drilling and making sure you understand how to think on your feet. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that someone coming from a Jesuit high school background is capable of doing dynamic problem solving that someone from a public school background is not capable of doing unless they have reached the first to second year of college. Now, or, or perhaps they've met a teacher who turned them on on the side. Correct. Sort of mm -hmm. happened with me. Oh, can, I, can I get back to, to, to Pam's question from before and ask you, um, was there a crystallizing experience for, Ms., for Dr. Vitek? Um, when he started, I, I don't really think it, that he was born the prodigy and then it became this octopus growing throughout knowledge. I think sort of like that was like Dr. Patel's decision to be that. And I think um, I would like to know, was there a crystallizing experience that started to um, uh, started you doing that? Like, for example, um, what did it feel like to be presented with your first robotics kit, for example, or that sort of thing? Well, well, I started out initially as a science nerd, and I also was good at mathematics. And the teachers that taught me weren't exactly knowledgeable as to the severity of my visual impairment. Mm. So they saw my innate abilities and encouraged me to move further. And tried to cope with, with the difficulties as best they could. Correct. Well, the well, science nerds are the very best kind in my opinion. But um, Additionally, additionally, uh, in my uh, case, I was mainstream long before mainstreaming was vogue. In other words, you should have had special treatment and they put you in the main class. Correct. So you became the smartest kid in the class rather than in the special class because the special and gifted is the same specialty. But because we don't pay our teachers enough, we end up diverting the special and gifted teachers strictly to those who are behind trying to help okay. corral people forward instead of helping people go forward the way we're supposed to. But well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go I back to anymore? that individual well, here because I had the complete opposite. I grew up in the Bronx and the education in the South Bronx was very poor. So my dad said, I kept being skipped. 
you know, graduated high school at 15, three students wow. in the Bronx, because they didn't know what to do. But it wasn't that I was learning anything. And I wasn't in that Jesuit environment. It was that I had something in me that I didn't even understand yet about knowledge. So I'm going to go back to that initial question. So then they sent me to the Cathedral High School, which I totally was in trouble with all the time, because I didn't agree with anything they said. I was a self-thinker, as one will probably know, all the time. I was born a self-thinker. If I don't know it, I will grab a book. I will call you up. I will listen. I will take from life what I need. I was born with that trait. I will fight anyone who tries to say, I can do something. I was a mom at 16 of two children, 17. Nobody was going to tell me that I was going to be someone who was going to be on welfare on that. I took a dollar book, Lionel Sherrard's Modern Approach to Marketing Research, and I went for a job interview and got the job. So I'm going to go back to my initial. I'd love to get the credit for all that as me, Pam. But there was a drive in me from the day I was born. And I was an Italian girl in an Italian household with amazing parents who said, Alan, Jim, let's go outside while your mom and Pam set the table, clean off the table, clean the house. But I didn't become that woman because I rejected it. So that's not neurons. That's a personality trait. It's nature well, and it's exactly. not a teacher necessarily. It's, it's not a borough. <laughs> it's a treat. Well, it's well, the argument that it's, it's, it's in, in, in your genes. Fact, in it's fact, in my if, genes. If you're it's Roman Catholic, genes. we call it being a bad girl, which you're supposed to be if you're a Roman No, the bad girls in my neighborhood just went to bed with guys all the time. No, no, no. I was no, studying. No, 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 no. The rebellious ones are really the bad girls. Those were good girls trying to be anything. Yeah, that's true. Very true. But what I guess the question is, is in that neuron, that, I, like I said, I, I would like to believe that if we change the school system, if we this, but I also have two sons, you know, who didn't even know their dad. They're amazingly preconceived. What I did really as a mother was just encourage them to be anything they wanted to be. So, you know, their dad was a musician. Michael's a musician, but he's geeky, just like you. The two of you have to meet. And Robert is working for Obama. You know, funny as hell, always been like his dad. They have like born with the traits. That's what I want you to explain to me. Do these neurons, can you add, detract? Does the teacher matter? What, Does what? whether you can see matter? What, what, have, what matters? Did you oh, know okay. that what, a neuron what? is as complicated as a decade ago PC? Yeah. And, sure. and they're a network. And in fact, if you were to compare a brain with the network of the country yes. on the telephone system, the telephone system of the country would fall far short. Like, like so, a so I guess tragic. I want to ask for, we always believe in looking outside Just to give yes. a as if it's now, the answer. That's a perspective thing, but and like, yeah. right to that point, my experience is, is different. African American. Uh, come up, up in, uh, in uh, the 30s and 40s, being 85 years old. Right. I went to a public school with all teachers who were Caucasian, and I wanted to be a doctor. Right. But one of the teachers told me, do you know that you have to go to a four-year college and so and so and so, and so and so and so. Right across the street from me, was vocational high school, which was an auto mechanic school. Right. So he said, well, you're in the neighborhood, the school right across the street from you is an auto mechanic school, and maybe it would be best for you to go there, That's because awful. it takes a lot to become a doctor. I opted to go to D. with Clinton, because I wanted to become a doctor. I dropped out of D. with Clinton, because my grades wasn't as good as it could have been for the standard that was at D. W. Clinton at that time, that which, was, which was one of the better schools in in the Bronx. Right. I dropped out at 17. So there's a different experience there in right. terms of the learning experience. Did you now, feel like you were being disturbed? Let me, let me interject this. I have a learning, I have a 
sweet deficiency. And at the seventh grade, the teacher said, everybody has to read. I read. And he stopped me, he says, I, I, after school, after the class, I don't want to talk to you. He said, you have a this speech deficiency, and we're going to put you in the, a class. I had to learn how to put a and that was called CRMD, correcting so and so and so and so. The people in that class were, now I know, there were people who have, were dyslexic, there were people who had learning disabilities, there were people who had hearing disabilities, all in one class and didn't have the opportunity to have the individual instruction in the ghetto uh, of a black uh, 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 all black school in the ghettos so in other words an underclass um, population at a time when even the whole class was being shorted for such services yes so you got a group of people in a class who can't get whatever it was that was driving others who had more. And not only that, if you didn't find out that you had a hearing disability and you was in the back of the class and you didn't get it, so your, yes, hearing, it might bad, have been, that, your hearing might have been bad or your sight might have been bad or your speech might have been bad, but they were all put in a CRMD corrective reading modality. All of which wasting your time and building your frustration. And whatever it did. But now, Dr. Pacheco came through his environment, you came through yours. Now, I'm an 85 year old African American, having been on the police force for 14 and a half years, did nine and a half years in the penitentiary, and working now to get my. Uh, 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 masters and going to get my PhD at 85. So my drive is the same as anybody's drive to say, I want to do this. And I think that it compares to what was ever driving Marco, what was ever driving you, what was ever driving you. So there's some, some something there that each individual has that goes beyond the the, the Whatever the, the What made you have the drive now that you didn't have at 17? What made uh, you have the motivation? You have the motivation now, but at 17 you didn't have that same motivation I, to I finish think, high school. I think I had the motiva motivation, but I didn't have the people the or, or the, the but same. You didn't have the support. You could do that. Like, you was in the Jesuit school, with, and somebody was saying, you can do it, whether it's the family, the environment. Right. But the teacher was telling me that I couldn't. But you made that decision to go to DeWitt Clinton, which was an academic school and not the vocational school, correct? Right, yeah. Okay, so then you had that motivation at that point at 14 when you started high school. But at 17, you left DeWitt Clinton. Because my grade wasn't... Yeah, but you didn't have, what was, so this te you didn't have the support from the teachers? You needed more support what? than was available. And in fact, the teacher who was trying to direct you to the vocational thing realized that the support that you really needed for what you wanted wasn't there and they couldn't do it for well, you. Well that's why I hate the and word disabled. To begin with, those right. are subtle negatives for damn sure yes. because now I'm going to throw out something about your neurons and go back to that. Yeah. Chuck <laughs> Close, the famous artist said when he ended up in a wheelchair. Now, you know, he's a great painter, right? You've seen his work. He's a million dollar painting. When he finally got to the point where he couldn't walk, it was in a wheelchair, and his whole soul movement was just that he was painted, he said his work never got better because he never could get sidetracked with the small stuff. So he was totally focused. So in that, I'm going to ask you this question. Do you think that your sight increased your scholarship? and your brain, and you're being sidetracked with stuff that wastes a lot of time sometimes. The resistance built, the resistance built your drive. 
In yeah. other words, having an obstacle. Or that you don't have a million things that you can do in the course of a day, so you stay there for hours oh, okay. doing the well, same thing. Well, that's in, with yeah. a, with in my disability. In, okay. Not the word. In, a my, child, in yeah. my instance, yeah. it fortified my determination because it gave me um, the the impetus to find new ways of doing the same thing. For example, uh, presently I use robots and machines to compensate for my vision problem. And when I first came here, I should have used the eye drops before I left. But that's besides me. Or brought them. Yeah. The glare is bothering me. Which one? That's okay. From behind me? Yeah. Don't they worry have, about it. Don't, don't, light, yeah, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. The eye drops would have handled that. Um, so, for example, when when I first needed to come here, I used one of my robots to actually see the terrain before I got here so I could find landmarks. That's fine. Yeah, so that's fabulous. I mean, you do end up in so-called, I don't know if the word is compensation, but in a working with not what people take for granted. You're in on a discovery path that can make some unique answers, actually. Yes. yes. But what about going back to this thing that I said about if you can do three things less than everybody else can do, does it make those other things more profound? Well... I'm actually able to do more because what I tend to do is to have multiple things going on concurrently. And I not only do more in terms of concurrency, yeah. I do more in terms of information processing. To, to get what you need. Correct. To get to the part of what you need. Correct. Okay, do you think those neurons that you initially talked about and how all this science work grows from that? Or yes. not? You think it grows from that? Yes, yes. For example, um, in, in the book, Nervotron, a functional silicon analog to the neuron, okay. it, it has... Give me about a half an hour. Uh, instances yes, we, we, we in the appendix of, of two form, machines form, that I have designed six. and built right. so, to compensate for my deficiency. Okay, good. One out. is the reading machine, which I des designed and built to actually read printed matter to me. That's fabulous. The other was the exploder which was a machine that learned material that it was fed and from that generated actual textural reports. Oh. Basically, it wrote for me. Okay. Well, I, I, and, and in fact, as an example of it, my book was written entirely by the exploder. And the exploder is what? The exploder is a cybernetic writing system. Define it. Okay, cybernetic means that it's a processing based writing system, in this case, electronic. Okay. And it learns, by example, forming informational network interconnections okay. between facts and characteristics. So you things. feed it the facts and the characteristics and it, it writes the sentence for you? No. It okay. was fed the information. It then extracted 
the facts, the characteristics, God. and the information. And you made them all explicit. Oh my God. Is that heavy or what?